You've been diagnosed with IBS. You've tried changing your diet, reducing your stress, maybe medication, but you're still suffering with the pain, the bloat, and irregular visits to the bathroom, whether it's constipation or diarrhea, and it's really making you miserable and ruining your life. The truth of the matter is that IBS is not a diagnosis, it's a description of symptoms. And that's where the disconnect happens because it's not getting, it's not isolating the root cause of why this is occurring. So that's what I'm going to go through with you right now are the five key root causes. Number one is something called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO for short, or gut dysbiosis. All that means is that bacteria of the bad kind, so the bad bugs, are growing where they shouldn't. Either it's in your colon, so your large intestine has a sort of a skewing of too much bad bacteria versus good bacteria. Also, in your small intestine, bacteria have gotten there, which shouldn't be there at all. So why does this happen? There's, there's a few different reasons, and, and that's what's key to this. One point I did want to mention is that it's been estimated with research that up to 38% of people who have IBS suffer with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And the symptoms are very aligned. You've got the pain, you've got the bloat, constipation, diarrhea, or both. So the symptoms are exactly the same, but if, if you don't find out the root cause, you're not going to be able to handle your problem. And living with IBS is miserable and, and you shouldn't have to do it. So here we go. Uh, with the bad bacteria growing in the small intestine, what tends to happen is, one, you could be taking a PPI, a proton pump inhibitor. Uh, Nexium is an example. There are omeprazole, pantoprazole. There's several examples, but you're on it because you have acid reflux, and it's a very, very common drug. The problem is that the acid in your stomach is there for a reason. So when you decrease the acid in your stomach, you allow bad bacteria to procreate, and then they have uh, kind of a field day living on your food, and they grow in your upper small intestine where they should not be present at all. And it can create a lot of bloat, as I said, pain, discomfort, all those same symptoms that you're suffering with with IBS. But now you're knowing why. Now, gut dysbiosis is really the same thing. It's bad bacteria, too many bad bacteria, but down lower in the colon. Now, the, the PPI medication, having a hiatal hernia can cause that. Also, a poor diet, having a long history of antibiotic use on and off can do that. If you're somebody who's suffered with constipation, then that slow motility through your colon allows bad bacteria to procreate. And um, if you don't have enough stomach acid or you don't have enough um, pancreatic enzymes, these things can all allow bad bacteria to multiply. So we have to figure out A, if that's going on, and then B, of course, how to treat it. So I'm going to go into treatment later. I want to go through these five different causes, and then we'll go into testing and how to treat it so you can really be directed on how to handle the situation. Number two is inflammatory changes post an infection. So that means you got food poisoning, traveler's diarrhea, you got a really, you got a gut infection. So a lot of times that with that comes diarrhea, sometimes vomiting, uh, but it's, it's sort of post-food exposure. And when that happens, um, if, if you had a supremely healthy gut, you could get over that just fine. Unfortunately, most of us have what's called a leaky gut, meaning that the integrity of the lining of your gut is not as strong as it should be. So you get a really bad infection, and what happens is that the, the bacteria, the walls of the bacteria open up, and the toxins flood out, which is why you have the terrible symptoms. But if you don't have good integrity of what's called the barrier of your intestine, then those toxins get out. So you, you have a leaky gut, which you've probably heard of, and then the, the bacteria, the toxins from the bacteria get out, and then they go through your entire body's bloodstream. So now you have this big inflammatory change, which is why you can feel so horrible when you get food poisoning, uh, but it sets up this 
systemic response, meaning body-wide response of your immune system is just saying, what was that? And it gets very alert to uh, reactions. The inflammation that occurs triggers the nervous system of your gut to get inflamed. And you can get into a catch-22 of because of this inflammation of the very nerves of your, of your gut, you get pain more easily. So the nerves are sensitized, basically. So you feel pain more readily, hence the gut pain associated with IBS, which can be quite miserable. Also, the immune system is inflamed because of all these toxins, and it gets into sort of a cascade of you've got pain, you're sensitized, motility changes, and the motility can be too fast, which is the diarrhea type, or it can be too slow, which is the constipation type. So either one can occur due to this inflammation, and then sometimes people swing back and forth between them, but it's all due to this sensitization and inflammation. Again, I'm gonna talk about testing later, but the key is we have to find out what has gotten the immune system so revved up that it can't get out of this uh, reaction. It's in a stuck reaction and uh, you can get out of it. So that's the good news, but we'll get to that in a bit. Number three are food sensitivities. Now this one's interesting because some can be the, ca the cause, a causative agent, which is what we're talking about, but some can be a consequence or more an, an effect. So food sensitivities that are true triggers are things like gluten and dairy, and there can be soy and corn, and these are actually acting as inflammatory agents that are creating imbalance in the gut and leading to the infections that, uh, sorry, the symptoms so associated with IBS. Now, when you have the IBS picture going on and you have all this inflammation and either slowed motility or too fast motility, then what happens is, is you're just very um, reactionary. Your immune system is very reactionary. And this is where people can really get into trouble. So they try low histamine diets, they try low FODMAP diets, and I'm not saying those don't have any benefit because they do, but they have to be done in route to a solution, meaning you're not supposed to be eating that restrictively forever. And I see patients who've whittled their diet down less and less and less and less and less foods because they go, oh, now this bothers me. Now, now that bothers me. And sometimes, you know, we meet people who are eating, you know, five different foods and, and, and that's it because they've, they've whittled their diet down to almost nothing. And so we're at that point, we're being the effect of the problem and not causative over the problem. So what we see with our patients is as, as you handle the root cause, then all of a sudden the, the, the diet can blossom out again and you're able to tolerate more and more foods, which of course is what we want. So the key here for a cause is that we wanna diagnose what those real food sensitivities are that are causative agents of the inflammation and dysfunction. And then if we have to do um, the other types of more extreme diets temporarily while we're getting to the root cause, so be it, but you're not designed to eat hardly anything and, and that's gonna be a solution to your IBS because it, it's not going to be and it's certainly no fun and not fair to you, um, but not necessary. So that's the good news. So we really just have to, to isolate the food sensitivities themselves. Number four is hidden inflammation or microbiome imbalance that occurs as a result of a chronic condition, whether it's a chronic food sensitivity or a chronic infection. This is, this is the effect of having been suffering for quite some time, whether you know it or not. You've got the symptoms, but of course you don't know what caused it. Uh, but this underlying undercurrent of, it could be a chronic viral infection, it could be a chronic bacterial infection. It could be a toxic load uh, on your body that, that you're not aware of, but it's been there for quite some time. And what it's done is it's uh, gotten your immune system on high alert and your immune system produces chemicals called cytokines. And what those do is they're very inflammatory and your 
uh, immune system is, is on a high alert status. And what that results in is uh, motility changes. You've got the, the bloating, you've got the pain, the sensitized nerves that I mentioned earlier, uh, but it's a bit, very much a chronic state. Unfortunately, this kind of thing can lead to autoimmune disease. So you really wanna catch it as soon as you can when this is the root cause. And typical blood tests don't find it. You have to, you have to use a specialized test to see what these inflammatory agents are, you know, what's inflamed, and then of course get to the reason why. So it's not hard to find, it's just that you have to know how to look for it. Number five has to do with vagus nerve dysfunction and the gut-brain axis. It's not complex. The vagus nerve is your longest cranial nerve. It goes throughout your gut. It also goes to your heart and your esophagus and your stomach and, and your, all your intestines. So um, it, the gut brain axis is simply the communication system between your gut and your brain, which is a very strong one. So what happens when the gut has been inflamed for quite a while, unfortunately, the vagus nerve gets irritated as well. This happens with hiatal hernia, it happens with acid reflux, it happens with SIBO, it happens with the gut dysbiosis, and where the, the gut-brain connection comes in, and the reason I'm discussing this is because so often IBS is chalked up to stress. It's like, well, it's all due to stress, and you just have to lower your stress level, or you can take the psychiatric medication, and it's kind of put in that box. So the reason that that can kind of miss the boat is that the gut talks to the brain, but the brain also talks to the gut. And in order for the vagus nerve to be happy in its very important communication between your gut and your brain, both, is you have to work both ends against the middle. You can't just uh, put somebody on a drug so that they you know, feel less stress, but you're not addressing the gut. And you can't just address the gut without also addressing the brain. So let's look at this. Um, serotonin is your happy mood calming chemical, we've heard, we've heard of it. 90% uh, of it is produced in the gut, interestingly. So right there, you've got this strong gut-brain connection. And when you're, we've talked a lot about gut dysbiosis, meaning too many bad bugs. So when you have, in order to make serotonin, so 90% is made in your gut, in order to make it, you need a robust amount of healthy bacteria. When you have IBS, you don't have that. By very nature of the symptoms, you don't have that. So it's kind of inevitable that you're not going to be happy, you're going to be moody, and you're going to be depressed or anxious. I mean, there's varying symptoms associated with not enough serotonin. I'm not trying to lock any symptom in, but when you don't have enough serotonin, you're not going to be stable, happy, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna express itself in different ways, whether it's moodiness or more anxiety or more depression, that's unique to the person, but low serotonin is, is never a good thing. So by nature of having gut dysbiosis, you're not gonna make enough serotonin, and so you're not gonna get the benefits of that happy hormone. So we've got that going on. Um, so we have to get enough good bacteria. So literally, not only can your gut make enough serotonin, but this is where it gets really interesting. The vagus nerve is the communique. It's the one communicating to the brain. There's enough um, serotonin here in the gut, so now the cells in the brain can release it. So forever, we have been doing this for 40 years, forever, we thought that the reason that um, that the brain made serotonin was that somehow the serotonin in the gut got into the brain. But it turns out it, do it doesn't. It's just a communication. Like there's enough here, brain, so now the vagus nerve can communicate that and then uh, in the brain, it is released. So it's really interesting. But you have to have the balance of both. So that's why 
when you're talking with you know gut problems and you've also got mood stress anxiety issues you've got to work both ends against the middle so i'm not saying that it's really stressful life is not going to impact your gut it is we have to work both sides uh, but it's really critical to understand that connection and not just blame it on life when we've got the gut biosis or the food sensitivities and the vagus nerve imbalance etc cetera, etc cetera. so hopefully that makes sense Let's look at conventional testing. You get your annual physical, you get your blood test. An annual physical blood test is not gonna pick up any of the factors that we've been discussing. Maybe you get a colonoscopy. That makes sense, right? Because your colon is a mess, whether it's constipation or, or diarrhea, either one, you're miserable and it's like, let's do a colonoscopy, let's see what's going on. And there's nothing wrong with that to rule out cancer, but it, it's a structure test it is a colonoscopy. It's not looking at function. So if you don't have anything structurally wrong, then it's not gonna find any of these root causes. And then finally, maybe you've heard of stool testing. So you say to your doctor, I want a stool test. The problem with that is that the stool test is looking for parasites, it's looking for blood in your stool, number one, and then it's also looking for parasites. It's not looking for bacteria and it's not looking looking at uh, whether you have a leaky gut, so you have this barrier dysfunction uh, going on. So it, it misses all of those, and, and that's the problem. So we want to do the right tests. So number one, we want to do a microbiome test that looks for not just bacteria, it also looks for parasites, it lo looks for yeast, it looks for protozoa, it looks at all of those things. It also looks at the barrier function, whether you have a leaky gut or not. So you're finding all these organisms, you're finding whether you have a leaky gut, and then additionally, a different test is a SIBO test. Do you have this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or is it just bacterial uh, imbalance in your colon? So we figure that out. Then there's food sensitivity testing that needs to be done. We also want to look for other toxins. So you can have mold toxicity, heavy metal toxicity. And then earlier I mentioned the cytokines, those inflammatory chemicals that get produced once you've had a chronic uh, issue with bacterial overgrowth and immune uh, stimulation. And so finding those is is a is a test unto itself so it, it sounds like a lot it's not that many and of course once you get a history from you it's it's more apparent which tests need to be done versus not so um, but there's you know there's just five key root causes and some even me describing them you know some you might say no that's not me um, oh that sounds like me uh, based on my history so um, that will help figure it out as well but you really deserve to get past IBS by getting to the root cause. And the beautiful thing is that while there are some drugs to treat IBS, the research that I did showed that, showed that as far as how people felt about them and, and their satisfaction score was less than 10%. So these drugs are not really cutting it as far as uh, not even alleviating symptoms because it was less than 10% satisfaction, let alone uh, curing it, meaning getting to the root cause of it. And we've definitely seen beautiful changes in people. And I've met plenty of people who are housebound uh, because typically it's more the diarrhea side of the equation where you just, you know, you can't leave the house or, you know, you just have to know where every bathroom is and route to work, et cetera. And it's a, it's a terrible way to live um, when you don't have to. Now, are there diet changes, lifestyle changes? Yes, there, there are. So there has to be that willingness to make some change, but the results are very worth it. Not to mention when you have a healthy gut, you have a healthy immune system and um, longevity increases. So there's a lot of good reasons to normalize your gut function. So I hope this was helpful to you and you learned some things. If you know somebody suffering like this, please share this with them. Um, help is available. And uh, if you like this, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, send me a comment. I love your comments. I answer all of them and we'll talk soon.